And now I would like to present our second speaker, Emma Reynolds. Emma is a mindfulness teacher for adults and for children. She has given many conferences, uh, talks at conferences, school conferences, teacher conferences, and in, in schools as well, uh, webinars on the subject of emotional intelligence and mindfulness. And uh, today she's going to give a talk which is called Training the Wandering Puppy Mind to Stay. So this is aimed at you and your pupils of pre-primary and primary level. So welcome, Emma. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Um, I'm going to dive right in. And um, as a mindfulness teacher, I'm often asked what would be a really good practice just to get everybody's concentration. So I'm actually just going to do one right straight away before I really start. Because we have wandering puppy minds, which I will come to shortly. But I'm going to just invite you to um, close your eyes or lower your gaze. And I've got one of these rather wonderful things. Uh, it's a Tibetan singing bowl. And I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes and just notice how you're feeling right now okay so absolutely no judgment just closing the eyes and noticing how the mind is so perhaps busy maybe it's still thinking about that last session an email remembering something you should have done you know noticing that what would you call that busy planning remembering judging and then just noticing how the body is so again could be anything, tired, could be tense. Other words might bubble up like fizzy, excited. Again, not wanting to change it, but just noticing. And then I'm just gonna invite you to listen to the sound of this bell, okay? And the mind may wander and start thinking about things again, but as much as you can, just come back to the sound of the bell and just notice when you think it has finished, okay? <laughs> sound is starting to go and perhaps just noticing that you're breathing and perhaps just connecting up with your breath for a moment so perhaps feeling in the nostrils and then just going all the way down into the belly and then on the slowly letting the breath out and just doing that a couple of times okay so just breathing in normally just as you would normally Connecting with the breath and just breathing out. Maybe one more time. Breathing in. Breathing out. And then just noticing now. Maybe again just tuning in to notice how the mind feels. And how the body feels. And just seeing if that's different from 30, 40 seconds ago. Now, quite often when I do that exercise and I ask people how do they feel afterwards, they, not always, but quite often say they feel calmer and more present. So really I'm already beginning with what could potentially be a very small mindfulness practice that you could bring to your group. Just, in this case we're listening to a bell, but it could be just sitting quietly and noticing sounds in the room and then just becoming aware of our breath. And you may have also noticed that as you started to be aware of your breath, you started to breathe more deeply and slower. So we're just starting to calm the body down and the mind down. And that's really, really useful because, you know, in the classroom, you want our, our kids to be present, don't we, and calm so that they can learn. Okay, so let me introduce myself. So my name is Emma Reynolds and I am an accredited mindfulness teacher. I teach MBSR, which is Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. Um, this is for adults. And I'm also trained by uh, MISP, Mindfulness in Schools Project, 
to teach mindfulness to children as well. And so some of the practices we'll be looking at today come from their program. But I'd quite like to hear from you and just find out who I'm talking to. So perhaps um, I could introduce this first poll that we've got. We're just asking here, how often do you use mindfulness techniques in your classroom? So obviously things have changed at the moment. We're in very different environments to usual, but maybe you're still, if you're using mindfulness, um, using it in every class. Perhaps it's only once a week. Maybe it's just sometimes you've tried it. And, you know, maybe it's not a regular routine and perhaps it's never. So it'd be really great just to get an idea of your experience if you have any. And it's, of course, no problem if you don't have any. So I invite you to just click on that poll. Let's have a look. So we're getting some numbers through. OK, so. Yes. Sometimes, so yeah. Mm. OK. OK, so it's more or less a majority, although it's not a big majority, are saying sometimes. That's 48%. Yeah. And that's quite high, really, isn't it? It is. It is. It's really, it's, um, that's great. Mm -hmm. So we've got some people out there with some experience. We've also got, yeah, sort of 40-ish percent of people who have never done anything at all. Now, you may still know about mindfulness, but you've never thought about bringing it into the classroom. Um, and I am going to be looking today, um, at this session, at how, for, first and foremost, it's really useful for you as teachers. OK, and then how, as you get a grounding in it, how you could then see how you could bring this into the classroom, because really it does begin with you. So uh, let me just pop back again. There we are. So let's have a look at this. What is mindfulness? So let's just get some um, some words down here about what we're doing. What is mindfulness? Uh, a very easy way of explaining it is mindfulness is knowing what you're doing whilst you're doing it without judgment. OK, so what does that mean exactly? Well, maybe it would be useful to think about those moments of your life when you have a bit of flow going on, OK, when you're absolutely concentrated in what you're doing. Now, that might be teaching. It may also be when you're listening to a piece of music or when you're doing sport, you're absolutely 100 percent in the experience. And there's no sense of this sort of outside voice that's maybe judging it. OK, you know, you, and so, you know, when that other time happens, when you may be teaching and you've got this voice in the head going, this is going wrong. This is not what I wanted. This is you know, bad in some way. This is when we start to get a little bit judgmental with what's going on. We all can also have very busy wandering minds that float around in the past, in the future. The mind untrained can really wander about all over the place. And we can know that as adults and we can know that also in our students. So where does the mind wander off to? Well, let's have a look at this image for a second. So what's going on here? You may even recognize this as uh, something, you know, we've all been allowed out of our, um, of our boxes finally. <sighs> we couldn't wait to get outside. And then what happened? Were you completely present with the experience, really feeling the sunshine like the dog is? That's a dog, by the way. Okay. Absolutely 100% here, smelling the smells, feeling the sun, or were you mentally somewhere else thinking about, oh, I must do that thing, must oh, I remember that thing, maybe even, maybe even having an argument in your head, organising something in your head. This is what happens with us, that the untrained mind gets really, really floaty and goes all over the place. And it's very hard to really bring ourselves back into the present moment. In fact, there have been quite a few studies on this. One of the, the, the more quoted one is one from Harvard, OK, which reported that we are lost in thought 47 percent of the time. 47 percent of the time. And how do they know this? Well, they um, they invited a, a random group of people um, to put an app on their mobile phone and they just basically pinged them like two or three times a day asking them, where are you right now mentally? What are you doing and what are you thinking about? And so people were replying, well, I'm, I'm having my dinner, but I'm actually, um, I don't know, thinking about that email I really need to send. Or I'm walking down the street, but I'm actually kind of quarreling my, with my head with, in my head with somebody about that situation that happened maybe a week ago. So um, be interesting to know whether you think 47% is high 
or low. Now, interestingly, also, if you think about this from a teacher's point of view, that's also potentially your students. 47% of the time aren't actually mentally present with you, that they are floating about all over the place. Again, doing the same sort of things, remembering what's just happened, planning something or worrying about something that's happening in the moment. I'm not getting this. I don't really understand. OK, what we really need uh, when we're going to teach is that we really need the students to be absolutely with us. So mindfulness is really useful for this because it's all about focusing our attention on the present moment. And interestingly, their conclusion from Harvard was that a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. Because quite often when we do wander off, we get, you know, quite worried. I mean, especially in this sort of moment that we're living through, um, so many people are finding it so very, very stressful because the mind is constantly going into the future, wanting to know what's going to happen. This Suddenly we've got this incredibly uncertain future. I mean, the reality is we really never knew what was going to happen in the future. So we've always been holding on to this sort of sense of control. But really, you know, anything can happen at any moment. So there we are, rehashing the past. So all those if onlys or rehearsing the, fu the future. What ifs? So what can we do about this? Well, this is a rather lovely image uh, from the Mindfulness in Schools project um, that I teach. It's from their course called Pause B. And this is specifically one of the frames that they use there, which is talking about our attention. And this is a really nice sort of way of thinking about our mind that really it's like a puppy. It wanders about all over the place, <laughs> sniffing aimlessly. It doesn't stay where you want it. And it brings back things that you don't ask for. And it can make messes sometimes. OK, so it's a really lovely image that we can bring to children to start really looking at this concept of like we've got this thing called attention that floats about. And actually, there's a really great little practice that you can do. So if you clap your hands, OK, one, two, three. And you can start to feel that sensation in your fingers. Where is your attention right now? It's in the fingertips, right? So a minute ago, it was just floating around listening to me. And then suddenly, boom, there's your attention. It's in your fingertips. And now if I said to you, can you really feel your bottom on the seat? Just feel the weight of your body sitting here right now. Wow. Yes, there, there it is, suddenly. A minute ago, you were floating around, then you suddenly have an awareness of hands, now you have an awareness of sitting on the seat. So we can actually place our attention where we like. And if we train it enough, we get really good at this. So we can have a floating attention, which is really not on the present moment, or we can choose to bring it back to the present moment. OK, and so we talk a little bit about how we do this. Well, if you were training a puppy, you know, you, you sit a puppy in front of you, he's completely untrained and you say sit. What happens? Does he stay there? No, he wanders off, right? He wanders off and does all those things we've just talked about. So how do we train our puppy or in this case, our puppy mind? Well, we ask the kids that. How would you train a puppy? And quite often they come up with, well, we pet it, we give it treats, um, we congratulate it when it does, you know, you know, it sits for a little bit longer. And, you know, we can say things like, well, would you would you shout at it? Would you be angry with it? And no, 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 we wouldn't do any of those things. I'm like, yeah, exactly. We'd be kind, wouldn't we? We'd be patient. We'd be firm. We'd be patient. We'd be kind. And there would be a whole bunch of repetition. So at the, at, the, at the beginning, the dog doesn't stay. But if you do it enough times, bit by bit, it gets the idea, all oh, right, to stay, ah, oh, OK, to stay. And that is really how we can train our own minds, OK, so that we have to keep doing it. And, and obviously, you know that as teachers at the beginning, with anything that's new, it's difficult and it takes time. We have to keep coming back to it over and over and over again. But look at what happens bit by bit. We can start to focus in and bring the mind to where we want it to be. OK, so um, I'm going to just invite you as participants right now to just try this for you. This is kind of like the adults version. OK, I'll, I'll look, I'll bring the children's version in a minute, but I'm going to invite you to just come to your own present moment. So maybe at the moment your awareness is 
listening to me. Maybe you're making notes. Maybe you're thinking about email. Okay. I don't take any personal offense if you discover that your mind has wandered. We already know that half the time our mind is somewhere else. Okay. But I'm now inviting you back into this talk and to just get curious with yourselves. Okay. So let's just close our eyes or lower our gaze. And let's just maybe just feel the bottom on the seat for a moment. Okay, so just that, suddenly having an awareness of sitting here or maybe the feet on the floor. So we're bringing our attention into this present moment experience. And you'll notice it's through the senses. Okay, so we're trying to get out of the mind and really into the body. Maybe just taking a deep breath in and then just noticing where your thoughts are. So remembering that mind, mindfulness is noticing what you're doing whilst you're doing it without judgment. So if you're giving yourself a hard time for having a wandering mind, just see if you can drop that and come back. And it may be useful just to label it. Oh, planning, ah, remembering, mm, judging. Completely acceptable, all of it. See how lovely this is? There's no wrong answer. There is just your moment to moment experience. And now noticing how those thoughts are creating perhaps a feeling within you. And it may be just a very, very light sense of, I don't know, feeling a little bit anxious or a little bit concerned. Maybe there's boredom here tiredness. So again, just allowing whatever is here to just be here. But then we go one step further with our curiosity and curiosity really is the key to mindfulness. It's like, ah, what's here right now? Starting to notice how the body is. Okay. So starting to know if there's any areas of tension. And I'm sure you have your top three areas of tension in the body. Quite often we can find it in the forehead, the jaw, it might be in the throat, the chest area, neck, shoulders, or possibly in the stomach. A lot of anxiety often shows up in the stomach area or even the lower belly. But you may also notice tension in other areas like the arms, the hands, or the legs. Okay, so just this gentle noticing. So it's like sort of taking the weather report of how we are right now. And then just becoming aware of the breath. Okay, and now you can either become aware of the breath just in the nostrils, just feeling the breath moving in and out of the nostrils, or you might like to follow the breath all the way down from the nostrils into the belly and all the way back out again. And it may even help you to place a hand on the chest and another hand on the belly by the belly button, literally feeling the sensation of that breath moving in and moving out. So just connecting with the breath. As for some people, when they're anxious, this is actually not a good thing to do. And that can happen with children as well. So you can give them another option, which is feeling the bottom on the seat, okay, or the feet on the floor. Okay. And then finally, just before we end this, just becoming aware of sound. Okay. And then just checking in to see how you feel. that just bringing our attention to how we are and how we are emotionally and how we are in our own heads can really start to calm down what's going on. Okay, and then just gently opening the eyes and maybe just having a little bit of a stretch. And I'd like to just invite you to just, um, I've got a moment here of have your say, to just let me know what types of stress are you and your ch children dealing with right now, okay? So, 
coming into just being invited to yeah okay give us some feedback yes I am still awake <laughs> <laughs> Emma and I imagine that there are different types I think and, and probably during the day many people feel different um, types of stress because the day is long but um, yeah they're coming in now the future uncertainty the amount of homework I presume that's for the children yes children are receiving a lot of homework so uh, especially in in mid and late primary lots of different subjects receiving homework on a, on a daily basis for those um, subjects um, the frustration yeah, so a lot of people are, uncertainty is coming up a lot. Uncertainty, absolutely. So we've got this mind that wants to know what's going to happen so we can feel safe and be and plan for it. And yet, look, suddenly everything's gone up in the air. And that future mind, the one that keeps pulling the future into the present, and going, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, is really stressing us all out. Absolutely. Yeah, and what's going on with that? Okay, so this is... The, this is um, other things as well that could also be going on with, with the students, so difficulty concentrating, yeah, because our mind is busy and it's going other places. Um, you know, if they're having to do some sort of exam or performance stress, you know, they've got to talk in public, they've got to speak in front of the other students, um, bit of peer pressure, social media, difficult emotions, ever busy mind. Okay, so what's what's going on here as well? Perhaps, um, you know, we can just consider for a second, what does it feel like? What does it feel like when we get stressed? What happens to us? Okay, and what is it? So, some of you may have noticed during that exercise, you know, a bit of tension in the shoulders, maybe the heart beating a little faster, maybe there's shortness of breath. And really, this is something that you may already know, but I'm just will review it just in case you don't, which is it's our survival mechanism. OK, it's our fight and flight mechanism. So all this tension in the body and tightness is coming about when we have either a real threat or a perceived threat. OK, so the mind picks up a story, what's going to happen in the future, starts really over planning and worrying, and it gets the whole mechanism going. So instead of being in this lovely calm state, which is what we need to be feeling okay and happy and to learn, we've suddenly got all of this adrenaline and cortisol running through our bodies, getting the heart pumping, getting the stomach tightening, uh, tension in the body, because we're getting ready to, to physically do something, fight or flight, as, as our you know, cavemen and women ancestors would have done. And yet this is really unnecessary. We, we, there's nothing to fight or run away from at the present moment. So it's kind of having an overactive system that just keeps crashing in in the middle of moments when we actually need to be thinking um, more clearly. And just to go through this very quickly, we have this lovely image of this comes from uh, Dr. Dan Siegel. It's a very useful um, image of what goes on with us when we're stressed. So here we are. This is the, if you can imagine, this is like a little head here. So here's our, our, um, our neck coming up into the, the brainstem. And here we've got a very old system, the, the limbic system. We sometimes call it Lizzie, uh, the Lizzie lizard brain. So very reactive, emotional, fight and flight mechanism. And then as we've kind of you know, developed uh, through evolution, we've grown more and more layers of this brain until eventually we've got this top layer, which is what puts us at the top of the sort of food chain, as it were, the wise leader, prefrontal cortex. OK, and when we're in a nice, calm, learning, you know, state and everything's OK, this is all working perfectly. But the minute we start to get stressed out, we start to do this, we flip our lid and we we don't really have much control over this because it just happens. It just we start getting into this mechanism, fight and flight, and it can actually happen in milliseconds, okay? So for teachers, you might recognize this in our adult world that everything's okay, everything's okay, and then suddenly, boop, you get a WhatsApp, or you get an email, I need to talk to you. And suddenly, <gasps> you get this feeling, oh my God, what's happened? It can happen so quickly. It's you flipping your lid. Suddenly, there's an alert, there's a problem, I need to fix it. And the problem is, that this mechanism, although it's trying to keep us safe, is actually keeping us from using our very wise leader brain. And instead, we can be 
slightly running around like headless chickens, biting or flighting, which is not very useful. So mindfulness is really useful for being able to find ways to bring this back online. So it's really useful for us as teachers, but it's also really useful for our students as well. So we recognize they're getting a bit stressed out or their minds wandering and they're worrying about what's going to happen. And we can start to calm them down. Okay, so let's just have a look at some practices that we can bring to students. Now, obviously, um, this is um, a webinar for a wide variety of students. Okay, so um, I'd just like to preface this now with these are exercises. Some will be useful for all of primary. Some of them will be useful for primary and pre-primary. And it's just a case of trying different things. Like obviously, you know your students. Um, there is also um, a handout which accompanies this talk, which is um, I put loads and loads of practices in there. Okay, and I've put in quite a lot of links as well there's links for meditations for students there's links for meditations for you as teachers to get you into a calm state um, there's things that are more suitable for for little ones and there are things that are more suitable for primary okay so obviously I haven't got very long it's only half an hour but I'm just gonna sort of run through a few things that you can do okay so one of the things that um, is really useful and really basic is just getting connected to our breath which you maybe hopefully already experienced. So sometimes it can be quite abstract when you say to people, connect with your breath. And you're like, what do you, what do you mean? So this physicality of placing one hand on the chest and one hand on the belly and maybe closing the eyes or lowering the gaze just allows you to not only feel the breath going into the body, but actually feeling that movement of the hands moving backwards and forwards. And that can just be an anchor to just bring us to the present moment. And that could just literally be three, four, five conscious breaths. So feeling that breath going all the way down into the belly and all the way back up again. And that could literally be the beginning of your session. Okay, another one could be, um, as we, as I began with the bell, you may not have a bell like that, it's pretty unusual. Um, but you can just invite students to close their eyes, lower their gaze, and just listen to sounds for a moment. And even, you know, ask them afterwards, what could you identify? Could you hear maybe three or four different sounds? Okay. And just uh, and just that placing of the attention on sound can really pull the focus. And then you go, ah, right, now you're all with me. And you can start your session like that. But also if you feel like a session is, you know, you're starting to lose their attention, you can go, you can just bring one in. Okay, let's just have a little mindful moment for a second. Okay. Let's just do what they call a fof bok. A fof bok, what on earth is that? Feet on floor bottom on chair. This is also in the handout. There's a, a little script for it and there's actually also a video for it as well. Okay, so this is a little bit like what we did um, where we noticed the thoughts, the, uh, the emotions and the body sensations. It's a sort of simplified version for kids. Okay, so you just invite them to close their eyes and become aware of seeing whether they can feel their feet on the floor and the bottom on the seat and then just noticing their breath. Okay, and that can be as short or as long as you like. And we've got another one which is called a petal practice. This is, um, often I do this one because it just has, I don't know, well, let's see. Let's not preface it with anything. You try it for yourself. Okay, so we're imagining that the hand is like a flower. And we invite, I'm inviting you and you would invite your students to just look at the flower. And as you are breathing in, you open the petals. And as you breathe out, you close. OK, so it's the breath that really um, sends, um, controls the experience, as it were. <clears throat> so it's not the hand that's moving backwards and forwards. It is the breath. So you're timing it with the breath. So bre let's just try that for a second. OK, so watching the hand. So breathing in. And breathing out. And then just doing that at your own speed, because everyone's breath is different. Okay, and I think there's some magic to do with this, which is something to do with having something to visually look at, as well as connecting with the breath, and also possibly having the imagery as well of this being a flower that's opening and closing. 
but you may feel and you may also not feel and maybe it's not the practice for you and that's okay but there's a sort of calming element to that and that is really again very useful because that's something you can give to your students you know when they're all getting stressed out at you know the thought of an exam you can go well just before you start your exam just take four or five breaths just doing that and just see how that starts to calm the mind down so you go out of this stressed fight and flight into back with the thinking brain again okay then this allows you to ret retrieve memory we have another one there which is pause and be okay and this is again another one you could really bring to the class it's one of those really quick practices where you just you just go pause be and that's it you just go like you just stop everyone just absolutely stop what you're doing for a moment maybe close the eyes and maybe just allow them to drop their attention to the feet so it can be super quick and sometimes that's just enough to just calm everything down and then come back again and then finally here we've got one which is following the hand okay and again this is nice because it's a sort of sensory experience as well so the finger is just rolling up and down so you're breathing in breathing out breathing out breathing in and breathing out okay and there we go there's some practices that you could bring in um obviously at the moment everyone is working at home which of course is bringing up its own stresses and strains and um so it may not be so necessary to say this to students because they're probably working on their own but who knows maybe not maybe they do have siblings around them as well but we invite them to not have to do it okay that's the first thing it's not mandatory because then they, then you create resistance we do not want any resistance it's all about acceptance okay but if they do want to participate, and this is maybe back in the classroom, that they, if they are going to get involved, they are just allowing themselves to be quiet and be in their little bubble. Because sometimes the tendency, especially when you do these things at the beginning, is a little bit of sniggering, a little bit of like, oh, I'll just poke my friend whilst he's got his eyes closed. So allowing them to be in a bubble, okay? And if you don't want to get involved, then don't do it, but just sit quietly. But if you do want to do it, then just come into this bubble. And if closing their eyes feels unsafe, which it can do, again, I mean, for a whole bunch of reasons, but possibly because they're worried that, that you know, someone's gonna be looking at them, that they actually don't close their eyes. They just lower their gaze and they take something like a pen and they just place it on the desk in front of them and they just look at that one thing. So at least they've just got one point of focus as they do um, a practice like connecting with their breath, okay? Another really, good and slightly sneaky one to do with them is um, sort of this sort of similar to listening to the bell is just saying to them look I'm going to and don't say anything about mindfulness or attention or anything at all I'm just really interested in wondering how many breaths you take in one minute okay I'm going to time you so close your eyes I'm going to set the timer don't do any special breathing just count your breaths so breathing in breathing out one breathing in breathing out two they do it in their mind's eyes so they're not saying it out loud and at the end of the minute i'll just you know let you know a minute has passed and how many breaths did you take okay so they of course think that this is all about how many breaths and did they win was it the right amount and you can kind of go how many had five or more put your hands up 10 or more 15 more 20 or more etc cetera, etc cetera. and you're not really that interested <laughs> in how many breaths they've taken per se but what you've got them to do is absolutely train their focus and their attention on their breaths however all what could be interesting for you is to also notice their stress levels because we have a tendency to breathe faster when we are stressed okay so and it might be just interesting to notice which students breathe quickly and which breathe slower because it might just give you an insight into how they're feeling secondly as they place their attention on their breath, quite often what happens is the breath does get slower, which is good, that's also calming them down. And finally, if you do this practice over time, you may start to notice, aha, uh -huh, something is changing, because when they come to this practice, just generally, the group is going slower. They are not doing so many breaths in a minute, which means that they are actually breathing deeper. So you can actually sort of see um, how, how they're you know, progressing, okay. So, something else to consider. <laughs> Love that image. Okay, 
that really you are the main factor in this mindfulness practice. Your stress levels are a good guide to how the children are feeling. So if you're coming into your classroom feeling stressed out, you're probably going to be transmitting that. Okay, so this is why I started really with you. In a way, it's a little bit like when you get on the airplane. You know when they say about the gas, the, the gas mask, the um, oxygen mask, you know, put it on yourself first before you give it to the child. Because for you to come into that classroom and try and do mindfulness when you yourself are not feeling very mindful, when your head is all over the place, it's just not going to work. Whilst if you can just come in and start the class, um, a little bit calmer, then that's you know maybe that's going to change how the, um, the the actual session is going to going to work, and so we can really help ourselves here. So things like labelling, okay, this is a really simple um, practice. Um, sometimes we call it name it and tame it, which is you know you're just about to start a session, and you just sit and go, what's here right now? And you might just go, yeah, um, I'd call this anxiety. And not, I am anxious, or I am angry, or I am frustrated, or I am worried, but there is anger, frustration, tiredness here. And this is you really talking to your nervous system and saying, yes, I'm aware of my state, and it's okay. And maybe from there, just taking a deep breath. So that the alarm bell of your uh, nervous system, your fight and flight mechanism, doesn't keep having to ring the bell to say, look, there's a problem, look, there's a problem. You're tired or you're hungry or you're angry or frustrated. You're saying, I know, it's okay, I've got this. And that can just calm things down a little bit. Another thing is taking in the good. We have a negativity bias, which is a tendency to look for all the problems all the time because it's part of, part of keeping us safe. So we have to make an active choice to look for the good stuff. Yes, I'm feeling anxious, or yes, I'm feeling a little bit tight in my stomach. But you know what? In my hands, I feel okay. Or the sun is shining. Or a million other things that are also going on, as well as this anxiety. Okay, so that we're placing that anxiety within a wider spectrum of other things happening in our lives. And that we can also choose calm moments. Because as we you know, can recognize, the mind can't tell the difference between a real threat there's a tiger in the room and a perceived threat. There might be a tiger in the room in the future. OK, so our mind goes to the future, brings back problems, brings them back to the present moment. But we can also choose to have calm moments. So if we're getting overwhelmed by, you know, endless news articles, maybe it's time to turn that news off and find something that actually promotes calmness. And, you know, that's also something to consider in the classroom. Like, is this just becoming too much and too stressful? Let's change gear. Let's just do a calming exercise for a moment. And just wrapping up, I'm aware of the time. Um, in, like I say, in the handout, there are some recommendations for places that you can look for um, more, more things to practice. For yourselves, you might consider looking at an app like Headspace or Calm or Insight Timer. And there are also mindfulness apps for kids as well. Um, I'm just put in there as well, there's things like a mindfulness course, MBSR, which is also very useful help for calming down mind. Why do all of this? Neuroscience tells us that neurons that fire together wire together. What does this mean? Repeated behavior, good or bad, gets hardwired into the brain and becomes more likely to be triggered in the future. Yeah, you get good at what you practice. So if you're finding you're practicing a lot of anxiety right now, guess what? That's what the neurons do. They fire together and they make those connections and they leap to that first of all. If you want to practice something else like being calm, then bringing a practice in every day to calm your nervous system down will start to become your new normal. So mindfulness starts to become a choice. I recognize where I'm going, I'm getting stressed. Do I want to keep going on that route or do I want to take maybe a different route and bring in a mindfulness practice just to calm myself down a little bit? OK. And really, it's a lot of information in half an hour, but really just one mindful breath is all it takes. OK, so just coming back out of the mind into the body. And that can be just taking a mindful uh, breath. OK. So there we go. If you'd like to um, send me a question about maybe what you've heard today in this session, then then please do. Let's have a look. Let's 
see what um, what might be of interest there. I know there's a lot of information, like I said, in the handout. It's um there's a good two or three pages there of uh, things that you can just try out. And I would really recommend that you just try little things. It doesn't have to be very big, but you know, and just. As you know with teachers, things maybe work first time brilliantly. I mean, sometimes they don't. You know, maybe it just takes two or three goes. But just to see what can happen. Um, they are based on very, very old teachings that are thousands of years old. So they've had a certain amount of, um, you know, trial and error. So, you know, just bringing something in. Give it a go. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. We have um, had comments. Um, people are thanking you saying that it's very interesting. It's been a great talk. Obviously, people have got a lot out of this, and I'm, I'm really pleased about that. One person asked if uh, you could show the slide with the apps again. Ah, oh, with the apps. OK, yeah, let yes. me just quickly flip, flip through. Yeah. So the one with the apps is there. So if you want to take a, a screenshot of that. OK, I know somebody else was asking as well, if I can just take it to the a few back. So somebody else was asking just about this, just so that they can see this one again. Okay. And then, so the other one was, I believe, looking at this one. Okay, so this is maybe for yourselves as teachers, just becoming aware of your thoughts, your emotions, your body sensations. And you maybe just notice those words around the side. These are so important. Curiosity. OK, just getting really curious with what's happening in the body without judgment. OK, and that there's compassion there. This is the other part of mindfulness, really, you know, allowing our present moment experience to be just as it is, because we can get so judgmental with ourselves and with other people. So calming that down. OK, well, one person has a question. What is the best moment of the class for mindfulness at the beginning, at the end? I imagine there are different moments depending on yeah. what's going on. Absolutely. I think that's your sensitivity as a teacher. I think, you know, as you maybe experienced, like sitting down to this webinar, it's exactly the same for the kids, right? They're, they're, they're just dealing with whatever's going on at home and then suddenly, whoa, I'm supposed to be, you know, attending to you. What about bringing one in right at the very beginning, maybe the petal practice or, you know, the fofbok, just being aware of your your feet on the, on the on the floor, just to get their attention. And that it becomes normal as well. So at the beginning, you know, it might be a little bit like, oh, this is something new and strange. Um, but later on, it's just like, this is just this thing that we do. I have a, a six-year-old at home, and I know that they do brain breaks. They call them brain breaks with them. And it's exactly that. It's like, I think the teacher just brings them in at any moment where it's necessary, you know? It's going well, it's going well. Suddenly, it becomes a little bit chaotic, and you feel that energy, and you go, right, we just need to change gear here. Right, let's just bring something in quick. That's great. And those, yeah. So, I'm just quickly having a look through. Yes. Do you recommend a book about it for teachers to? There's a lovely, um, I, I mentioned in a, another session I did, there's um, a Buddhist uh, Zen monk uh, called Thich Nahan. OK, um, he might well be in the handout, um, which is all about mindfulness for teachers. But actually, there's, if you look online, there's so much material about mindfulness uh, and kids everywhere. Everything from TED Talks through to um, YouTube videos to, honestly, just Google um, uh, mindfulness for kids. And you'll find a lot of practices there, which, you know, there's free, free material, free resources. Um, just play around, you know, find what works. That's great. Yes. And as Emma said, uh, there's a handout for this session with a lot of ideas and links and recommended reading. And if people want to find out more information, there are recommendations there as well. So I think that, you know, people have a lot to at least begin you know, yeah, their, their journey. Um, so thank you very, very much, Emma. That's been really, um, really useful. I think it's been a good moment for everybody. Um, a moment to focus, a moment to be calm, a moment as well to try out a couple of practices that could be applied in the classroom, both for the present situation and for the situation when it changes and we go back um, to our classes further on down the line. Um, and because we do recognize that teachers at the moment are dealing with a lot of 
um, different fronts that are open at the same time. Um, professionally dealing with classes, teaching online, um, combining that, juggling that with their with their private lives and their families, etc. So um, in our video um, at the beginning of this this event, and also we'll put it on again. Um, where we clapped um, to you, the teachers, uh, we genuinely mean that because the effort that you are making at the moment in order to keep um, uh, schooling going um, despite the, the, the circumstances is really um, worthy of enormous respect and admiration. So a big thank you to all of you.